keep promoting this is the last thing I promise the love like L O V E <laughs> all day. Hello and welcome to The Awardist. I'm Kristen Baldwin from Entertainment Weekly and I'm thrilled to be joined by two members of Pose Royalty, Emmy-nominated co-creator and director Stephen Canals and Emmy-nominated lead actress MJ Rodriguez. Welcome to you both and thank you for being here. Thank you for having us. So thrilled. Uh, Pose received nine nominations, including Outstanding Drama Series. So congratulations, first of all. And how did you celebrate this achievement? MJ, did you have a chance to celebrate? Yeah, I feel like I celebrated most like on the phone calls. I feel like my interviews were my celebration because I ain't never had that happen in my life before. And also, I got to celebrate with Steven. Like it was, he called me right afterwards. And then literally right after I found out my, my um, my information or nomination, he had found out his literally right in front of my face. And I was like, yes! so yeah, I guess those were all my celebrations. Well, that evening, um, I, right. I had some sugar fish and I, <laughs> and I definitely popped a bottle of champagne yes. to toast my achievement, our achievements, but no, it was really beautiful. The minute I saw MJ's name come up, cause I was watching it live we were FaceTiming. And so it was like really beautiful in real time to see her reaction to getting this affirmation from her peers. And then literally, as she noted, it's like, I found out that I got the writing and directing nominations in real time with her. And so we were just both yeah. having this really lovely moment, which for me was, it was really special, not just because I got to share it with MJ, um, who I adore, but you know, when the very beginning of this process of filming this season um we had had a, a private conversation about mj as an as a performer and about the character of blanca and what we wanted to accomplish this season together um mm -hmm. and then we we had that same conversation again going into the finale so we it felt like we were really truly lockstep as collaborators this season so it was really nice to be able to both have that moment we rose from the bottom and we became stars. When we walk together, we make a statement. I'm in. I recently rewatched the pilot, which has one of the most incredible opening sequences of all time with the House of Abundance raiding the museum to collect the royal accoutrement. Um, mm -hmm. So if you could go back to 2017 when you were shooting that and tell yourself one piece of advice about like what's in store for you, you know, cause you didn't know, I'm sure shooting the pilot, what a huge phenomenon pose would be. What would that advice be, MJ? I just had a, a gag moment cause I can't believe that's 2017 <laughs> and we're in 2021 right now. That's insane. Girl, get ready for the ride. Cause it's going to be a sickening one. It's going to be a little bumpy, but Hey, you know, it's going to be ups and downs, but you got to live through it, girl. You're going to turn it. And listen, you have a lot of people that you are going to make happy and change their lives. So girl, just keep doing what you got to do. Keep thriving and keep, people happy and keep promoting this is the last thing I promise the love like L-O-V-E <laughs> all day back in 2017 when we were filming that pilot I was I personally was coming off of two and a half years of being told the show has no value you're never going to get this made I don't know where the show lives I don't know who the audience is so I went into filming the, sh the series, even having Ryan Murphy as a collaborator and Brad Falchuk as, as a co-writer, and then having Ryan as the director of those first two episodes, in my head, I was still cycling through that, mm -hmm. those conversations and feeling like, I don't, I don't know if this is going to work. I don't know if this is actually going to do all the things that I hope it, it accomplishes in terms of the industry and visibility for LGBTQ plus people. So I wish that I had been able to just fast forward to this moment and know how it's received, mm -hmm. because then I think I would have just enjoyed the process more. MJ, when you joined the show, how much did you know about where Blanca's journey to motherhood and through motherhood would take her? Believe it or not, I didn't know that much about Blanca's journey. I only had a breakdown that I had read on Chelsea and Company when I was looking through, you know, breakdowns. And I, all I had known that she was this nurturing, caring woman. She was this woman who was obviously, you know, raised that didn't have a mother or a father. I knew those things within the breakdown. But when I got into it, I just 
I fell completely in love with Blanc. I was very happy with the writing. Obviously, Stephen did a sickening job, Emmy nominated. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I was very blessed because not a lot of trans women get the opportunity to get to show what a lot of women in the 1980s, let alone even 2021, you know, get to tell the story of how trans women are raising children who have been displaced from their home. They don't get to hear that. And what a beautiful way to do it through Pose, a, a story, a love letter from so many of the writers, many who really put a lot of work into, you know, really representing the LGBTQI community like how it should. I thought it was a dream. And no, I didn't expect any of this stuff to happen. I was a girl and still am a girl from Newark, New Jersey, who had aspirations and goals as a young actress really trying to fight my way into it and finally getting a chance to do it with my community and being a part of so many intersectionalities of being a Latina woman and being a black woman and being trans and oh, also being a woman, representing all of that and being able to show that through the television screen and, and show the true human aspects, show the true human existence, like collectively, that was the blessing. And I was glad I got to bring that to this woman because she was, uh, excuse me, I'm so sorry if I'm talking too long, Stephen, forgive me. But this woman, I'm inspired by her. Yes. I, I look at her and I'm like, oh my God. Cause I'm, you know, I had to channel this woman. I, I, I'm not this woman. I, I don't have children. I don't have kids. I don't have a house. You know, as Michaela J, I don't have these things. And when I saw the, the words come alive, on the pages, I was like, this woman came from nothing. She didn't have a father, a mother, but yet and still she raised three resilient children. She received the fruits of her labor. Yes. She got that. And that's what I was aspiring to be. And I'm so glad a lot of people got to see that too. And now I'm sitting up here wishing that Blanca was still here, child, because I meant her. <laughs> And, you know, speaking of family, Stephen, you know, this season brought us some real insight into the family history of key characters. Pray tell went home to sort of say, you know, have his uh, say his goodbyes to his family. And we learned more about Electra uh, and her family. Why was that something you guys wanted to explore in more depth this season? Well, I think a, a large part of it had to do with historically in film and television, when we're telling narratives about LGBTQ plus people, those stories are always rooted in our trauma. You know, we, we very rarely get to see our celebrations. We very rarely get to see the joy of what it means to be queer or trans. A lot of times those narratives are also, they begin with are being untethered from our family. You know, it's it's our family kicking us out, it's people discovering our, you know, who we are authentically. And then suddenly we now have to go forge ahead and 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 find community. And I think what was really critically important for us in the writer's room when discussing this final season is to show the fact that a lot of these people are actually still connected, that we as LGBTQ plus people are still absolutely connected to our birth families. We really needed to honor all of the complexities of that. So even if my relationship to my parent is as tenuous and difficult as Electra's is to her mother, that that's still a relationship that takes up emotional space and weight and it deserved mm -hmm. to be honored. And, you know, this final season, as the show has through all of its seasons, this season continued telling the story of the AIDS epidemic and the toll it took on this community, especially in the black and brown uh, community. And MJ, I read that you heard from several younger viewers who told you they like learned about the severity of the AIDS crisis, AIDS, a HIV crisis through watching Pose. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I am someone who I keep in contact with my supporters and my fans. I mean, it's hard for me not to because they really put a lot of work into building me up and giving me all the love. So with that, I get a lot of messages through my DMs and a lot of them would say, you know, I didn't know how severe and how um, serious the epidemic was, the pandemic was. And I'm so glad that I had that, you know, they're not telling me these things. And, you know, that surprised me, but also there was a 50% side of me that didn't surprise me because I just, a lot of people just don't know the severity of HIV and how it's still rampant today, you know, even the younger generation. So it was such a blessing to know that a show like this being 
beautiful and entertaining, it was also educational. And it got to tell people what we went through as people of color back in the 1980s and how we survived a truly serious pandemic. And, yeah. um, and, we, and we were here. Exactly. Yeah. And Stephen, you know, this season, especially uh, when you're telling true stories about the AIDS HIV crisis, including the emergence of ACT UP and how crucial they were and the, the, the uh, release of the cocktail and, mm. and the struggle for black and brown people to get access to that cocktail. As a writer and director, how do you approach those stories in a way that is authentic, but also doesn't come across as like preachy or didactic? You want it still to be a good story. Um, well, A, I appreciate you asking the question because I think, you know, in the f during the first season of the show, didactic was actually funny enough, the word that I always use uh -huh. in, in our writer's room. And I always said, I don't want the show to be didactic. I don't right. want it to feel like we're thumping the audience over the head with a lesson. I don't want, um, I don't want the show to feel like an after school special. And I don't know, I suppose if, if you break the, sh the series down, there are probably some episodes that feel that way to some discerning viewers. But overall, I think what we always talked about and the thing that I always hope to ensure with our show is that we just leaned all the way into the truth, you know? And so the reality is that like, we are beautiful, complex beings, you know? And for the characters on our show who happen to be Black and Latin who happen to be having a trans experience, who happen to be queer, that we are a series of multitudes. Like we're not right. just one thing. You know, we mm -hmm. are our joys and our triumphs, and we are also our hurts and our traumas. And like, and and what we what I hope to accomplish through the show was just to show all of that, you know, right. to show every single facet of what it means to just be a human. Right. Mm -hmm. Having a lived experience. The question we always were asking ourselves was, how do you make a way out of no way? Right. Um, and I think for all of us it, in the writer's room, and I think, it's, and for the actors as well who are portraying these characters, I think what we always did is we always referenced our own real lived experience. Yeah. You know, I think that's the benefit, to be honest, I think that's the benefit of, of allowing the individuals who have lived that life to tell their own story. You know, mm -hmm. the reality is that like, I never had to have a conversation with MJ about how to manufacture the feelings of what Blanca is going through because, you know, as folks of color, as queer and trans people, like we already understand that, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So there was always a shorthand to how to express the journey. Steven, you know, when you look back on, you know, season one to now, I mean, one of the thing that, things that strikes me is just how much M MJ has grown as a performer, like, it feels like every season, every episode, she gets more comfortable. How would you describe her growth uh, over the course of the series? It's been beautiful to see. I mean, the truth is, as MJ noted, and she said this, you know, multiple times in, in many interviews, like, you know, I'm just a girl from Newark. And the, the <laughs> truth is that MJ is, she's so unaffected by the ways that her life and her world has changed. So the girl that I met, the woman that I met in that audition room in, you know, the early part of, of the summer of 2017 is the same woman who I got to direct in our series finale. Like that never changed. Like she's just, she is so luminescent is the word that I use when I think about MJ, but she's just a bright light, you know, and she brings that to set all the time. You know, like, I don't think that, you know, sometimes as collaborators, you have moments where you bump heads or you disagree or you, and like MJ and I, whether we were talking about the show, whether we were talking about life, whether we were literally in the midst of, of a scene that I'm directing, whether it was emotional for her or not, that never was the case, that never happened. I think like we just don't, that's one of the places where MJ and I deeply overlap is I think we just, we bring a different energy and a vibe to the work, but yeah, it, it was always, I always felt like I had a co-conspirator in her. And so it's interesting because I think that the, the truth is I, I'm so wildly happy um, that she is now an Emmy nominated actress but the truth is like I felt, and perhaps I'm biased, 
But to me, it's like, it feels like everyone's just late to the party. Right. Like I felt that she was worthy back going back to the first season. I remember right. being at the monitor watching her during the scene when she's talking to Charlene Woodard's character, um, Helena, and, and pleading for Damon to get that audition uh, for yeah. the dance school. And I remember at that moment thinking that's going to be part of her Emmy reel. You know, and so the reality is like, has she grown? Absolutely. I would never take that away from her. But I, I think the reality is like the beauty and the greatness that people are recognizing in her now coming off of the final season. Like I saw that four years ago when we first met. Uh, I, love you. I love you. Do you know what the greatest pain a person can feel is? The greatest tragedy a life can experience. It is having a truth inside of you and you not being able to share it. It is having a great beauty and no one there to see it. This young boy has been discarded and he is so young. He believes that it has something to do with who he is. Steven is so smooth. It's like, like he said, it's easy. I feel like, you know, we had just a great vibe on set. We had a lot in common. He mentioned something that he didn't want it to be didactic. I didn't want Blanca to be didactic. I didn't want her to be the stereotypical character that everyone would see. And the fact that we thought the same, I knew that moving forward in the work together, it was just going to be a smooth, easy process. And that is exactly what it was with Stephen Canals. I'll never forget the moment in final season where he was like, take your moment. This is your time. And that felt so good coming from him. Not that it didn't feel good coming from any other director because I love all of the other people that were working, but from him, from the first time he saw me in that room to the time he saw me now, he, he, he ain't lied. I haven't been, I ain't changed at all. I'm still a girl, you know, from North New Jersey, just with, you know, a little bit of every nomination, you know what I am? <laughs> just but, a little <laughs> bit, just a little bit, yes. But like, he made it so easy for me. He never... It just was teamwork. And I always told him, I was like, teamwork makes a dream work, you know, That's being true. cheesy, but I I meant it. In the series finale, there's a bit of a Sex in the City homage. You have that amazing shot of Blanca and Electra and Angel and Lulu strutting down the cobblestone street in the meatpacking district. But then there's, mm -hmm. you know, the episode also throws a little shade at Sex in the City when Blanca says they need to call it being white in the city because ain't none of them uh -huh. got a black or Latina friend, which, you know, She's not wrong. Uh, Steven, can you give us a little background on how that element of the series finale came about? Sure. I mean, I think that part of it is we wanted a moment of celebration for the women. Um, and so we had talked about that in the room. I know when we discussed that the finale wasn't going to end, um, you know, on the heels of Pray Tell's death, but that we were going to time jump within the episode to 1998, Ryan Murphy was like, I think we need a moment where we get to see the women all together, um, mm -hmm. you know, communing with one another and we get to see how they've grown, how they've changed, where they are now. And so Our Lady J, um, writer, producer, she's the person who scripted the moments where we get to see them together. Um, and initially on the page, it was... I think the very first thing she wrote, if you read the script, is like they're walking down the street together and it feels like a sex in the city moment. And so I think it was out of that that we started having conversations about the ways that these particular girlfriends are distinctly different mm -hmm. from what we typically have seen on television. And so, I, you know, I know a lot of people have made a meal out of it feels like we're throwing shade at Sex in the City when the reality is I actually really love Sex in the City. I think it's a great show. I thought Sarah Jessica Parker and the other actresses on that show were fantastic. Um, but I think that we we wanted to highlight in our show, it seems maybe a little, um, it's a little knowing and a little bit wink, wink, but for us, we just wanted the audience to know that we're in on it. Like we're hyper aware that like, sure, there may mm -hmm. be some overlap, but this is very different. You've never yes. seen yes. four black women, four Latin women, four trans women. Yes talking the way that they're talking and having, you know, friendships and relationships exactly. in this way. I'm not going to lie. I mean, I thought it was, I thought it was very crafty and I thought it was actually spot on. I mean, it was, it, it's, you know, shade can be sometimes sharp and sometimes it can be truthful and uplifting at the same time. I think it was beautiful that we got to um, actually hold that moment together as the four women at the table holding counsel actually around so many cisgender women and us being the four 
trans women in that room having a conversation and fitting in and not having a worry in the world. And I think that's one of the reasons why I was rooted in that comment because it's just like, how many times do four trans women get to sit at a table with a whole bunch of cis women in a space, not be bothered and have a beautiful conversation about what's happened in their lives? Like yes. that was everything. Stephen, do you have a thought about what episodes the show might submit for its outstanding drama series consideration and, and what's the thinking behind them? I'm so proud of all of the episodes. And I think that there's an argument for each and every one of them. We're still having conversations about that, but for sure, you know, those conversations are coming from a place of intention and making sure yeah. that, you know, we're really thoughtful about what represents us. I would submit the seventh episode only because it's a great collection of all of us. It one was one of the longest episodes out of all of them. And it highlighted each and every one of us the way it should have highlighted us. And nobody Wonder Woman spins and twirls in the rain oh, quite like MJ <laughs> Rodriguez. <laughs> oh, you know I have fun with that Stephen too. You know I was still dancing after that whole thing. I just I know you did. <laughs> Wait, Kristen, can I tell you really quickly? When we yes. were filming that, it was so funny. So we're we're filming that and um and we worked really closely with with James Alsop who's an incredible choreographer and the first take which is actually on my Instagram page the very first take of me sitting at my village watching because I wasn't sure if the rain was really going to work because right. it was a practical mm -hmm. effect there was no VFX like it was real rain pouring in our ballroom set so we do the first take and it's great and then we go in to shoot it again and MJ she, she actually, in between the first and second take, she says to me, can I just really, like, I just want this moment to feel very ballroom. And I was like, it's your moment, take your moment. Like the cameras know what they need to do. You just have fun. She was like, great. So she does her spin and then she does a dip where she comes down. And it was like, everybody was just beside themselves. Like what is happening right now? And I think everyone's used to seeing MJ when she's playing Blanca's being, you know, yeah. Blanca's the mom, she's always yeah. very together. And so to see her just let loose in that way, like everyone was, it was crazy. But as I was editing it, it was great. I, I got a phone call from MJ and I was like, it's, you know, we're cutting the episode. It's beautiful. You're fantastic. And the only, the only time MJ has ever asked me for anything, she called and she's just like, <laughs> do me a favor. She was like, if in the episode, you don't keep the dip, can you just send me that clip so that I can personally have it? And I was like, I trust, trust me, we're leaving the dip in, the dip will be there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that was, he is right spot on. I was like, oh my God, no lie. That dip, I was so happy with that dip. Cause I could, I could have bust my butt y'all. Um, but I was real happy that I landed it. Yes, and now the world has it for posterity, not just you, everybody. It has been such a true joy talking to you. I have loved the show from day one, and I am so thrilled uh, to talk to you face to face. And congratulations on all the nominations, all the, all the success. And uh, we can't wait to see what you do in the future. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank this you. was great. Thank you so much. It really was. My cheeks are hurt, and I, I don't know if you see it, but they hurt again. Uh, uh. <laughs>